Welcome back, everyone, and thanks for being here. We've had an incredible day so far and a lot more in store, including this next panel, which is on ransomware, which is probably one of the most critical cyber areas of practice right now because it's just getting worse and worse and worse. But you'll hear that more from the panel. Let me tell you who we've got for you today, and hopefully you've got some questions and loving the questions so far. Um, and the chat is always fun to interact with each other. So first up is our moderator, Kate Hannaford, a partner on Alston & Bird's technology and privacy cyber and data strategy teams, where she focuses her practice on cybersecurity and privacy compliance and enforcement. She has multiple specialties, which is becoming more and more rare in the IR space, as a lot of us just tend to become specialized in the places that, that we feel most comfortable. First off, Kate specializes in any cyber or IR issues relating to financial regulations which have really exploded over the past year. And she's also um, a specialist in healthcare-related data breaches as well. I watched a, a webcast she did recently on Healthy Bites, and I realized she's developed a practice area that I'm, I'm not sure anyone else actually has, addressing the harmonization of, of HHS and SEC rules for healthcare companies that are also public companies. This makes Kate really the Gwen Stefani of IR because she brilliantly mixes these two disciplines, securities, reg, and healthcare, just like Gwen Stefani brilliantly mixes two disciplines of music, hip hop and dance. And Kate's theme song, uh, what else but um, Ain't No Holla Back Girl, a Gwen Stefani uh, signature tune. So welcome, Kate, thanks for moderating. <laughs> Thank you, John, I appreciate it. Can't wait to hear what you say about Tony and David. <laughs> Well, here, well, next up is Tony Kim, who is a very familiar face. I think he's done every single masterclass we've ever had over the last eight or nine years. Um, he's a career and seasoned cyber lawyer who's a partner at Latham & Watkins, a booming high-tech practice with some of the best and brightest in our space. What you might not see from Tony's bio is that he also combines several IR disciplines into one global practice. Rarely is one attorney so outstanding in all three disciplines of cybersecurity, data privacy, and consumer protection, be it remediating a breach, investigating a breach, litigating class action, or managing a regulatory action after a breach, whatever it is, he's an all-star. Um, Tony Kemp is the John Lennon slash Paul McCartney of IR, because when Tony shows up on an IR, it's a mix of creativity, passion, and talent, all wrapped up into one. And it's always such a pleasure to work with Tony with his the, the, the wit and grace that he has. And the best theme song, I would say, for Tony has to be Here Comes the Sun, most of all because everybody smiles and everybody's thrilled when Tony agrees to lead an IR. So welcome, Tony. Uh, thank you. That is all. <laughs> <laughs> Next up is Scott Linlaw. Uh, it's now become standard practice for IR teams to have a PR expert in the mix. And that's where our next panelist, Scott Linlaw of FGS Global, comes in. So what makes Scott stand apart from the rest? What's his differentiator? Um, what it is is that he's not an ordinary communication specialist. He was also once a seasoned cyber attorney at Oric, and before that, a veteran reporter with the Associated Press and a White House correspondent with a master's in journalism, who was even once nominated for a, P a Pulitzer Prize. So I've worked on a lot of cyber matters where the victim would prefer to keep the situation quiet, especially when a victim tenders a ransomware payment or mat or has to negotiate with ransomware attackers. And I can't I can't wait to hear Scott's take on this. He's he's both the Clark Kent and Superman of IR. And if Scott had a theme song, it would have to be Don't Worry, Be Happy, because that's how his clients feel after a visit from Scott. So welcome, Scott. Thank you. And finally, we have David Simon, who is co-head of Skadden's Global Cybersecurity and Data Privacy Practice and a member of the firm's National Security Group. David is another faculty member today who is the real deal and who we also owe our gratitude. After cutting his teeth as a special counsel in the U.S. Defense Department, David served on a part-time pro bono basis as chief counsel for cybersecurity and national security to the U.S. Cyberspace Solarium Commission, which is a bipartisan commission established by Congress to develop a comprehensive strategy to defend the U.S. from cyber attacks. He was also an independent legal advisor and experts committee member to the U.N. Counterterrorism Executive Directorate on Cyber Matters. Unbelievable. His experience seems to span several lifetimes in very contrasting fields and disciplines, and his associations and teaching positions are a mile long, which really makes him the the IR equivalent of John Rambo meets Bill Nye, the science guy. So, David, thank you very much for being here. And I'll turn it over to Kate. And can't wait to hear what you guys have to say on ransomware. Kate, 
Thank you so much, John. And thank you, Bruce. So after that, and we're all smiles, let's get down to brass tacks and talk about the horrors of ransomware. Um, so I guess, as, as we all know, as uh, some of this morning's panels have referenced, ransomware is a billion-dollar criminal industry. It is a rapidly evolving threat landscape with threat actors refining and shifting techniques with tremendous speed. Um, so when this group got together and we were talking about our panel, we decided um, rather than rehash, I think a lot of what has been, you know, ground that is always useful to talk about and always helpful in terms of talking about what we're seeing and, you know, best practices for handling ransomware, we wanted to talk about, you know, the disruptive, very shifted environment that we're now operating in, because I think this conversation, had it happened a year ago, would actually be somewhat different than the conversation that we're having today, um, based on a couple of factors that we'll talk about. Um, but we're in a, a much more challenging environment when it comes to responding to ransomware incidents um, that we're seeing them now. And so I think we we wanted to, you know, talk specifically more about what we have seen really within the past six to eight months, I think, probably since um, the initial um, law enforcement disruptions that happened starting in August of last year and continued into December um, and again into this year, that those have prompted kind of a, a new landscape in many ways for, for ransomware and in some ways a continuation or an acceleration of other trends that we had seen before. Um, so I'm really excited um, to be moderating this panel with Scott, Tony, and David, um, and we hope to provide a lot of insights um, to you on that. Look forward to a lively discussion. So please also keep the questions coming, um, and we will try to hit as many of those as we can in the course of the conversation. To level set, I think it's helpful to, to share some statistics about, you know, kind of where we are and what we're seeing. 2023 was a record year for ransomware payments. The ransomware payments that were reported in 2023 total over $1 billion and are accelerating and increasing. In Q4 of 2023, the average payment was um, over half a million dollars. Um, and there are over there were over 4,000 total reported attacks, which was a 37% year-over-year increase driven largely by RAS, ransomware as a service model, which is also causing some of the disruption and complications that we'll talk about. Um, and the average cost of defending yourself and responding to a ransomware attack are increasing. Um, it tends to be over, uh, the average cost is over $5 million, and that excludes a ransom payment. Um, and I think in general, we're seeing, you know, the impact of this recent law enforcement activity that's disrupt, that has disrupted criminal networks, which is, you know, I would, I would posit a net positive and a good thing, um, but it is producing volatile, unpredictable threat actors more affiliates with less kind of brand loyalty that we've seen in the past. And it poses a lot of different communications and compliance challenges, all of which we'll get into here. Um, and then in addition, I think as other panels have referenced, threat actors are able to execute with precision and speed. So the rise in incidents and payments has been proportional to the increasing sophistication of threat actors, their techniques, um, and their speed. They have sunk a lot of their funds back into R&D and they've got really good scripts that can run through systems really, really quickly. The average downtime that a threat actor is in a system in the U.S. is now five days. Two years ago, it was 10 days. Um, so I think as we as we kind of think about what those, those trends that we're seeing, um, I want to first talk about the first 24 to 48 hours of an attack and a lot of the key considerations that are there, in particular containment. More than ever before, ransomware attacks are designed to kind of inflict maximum disruption. So how do you get a handle on the situation? Tony, you want to lead us off? You're smiling, so you have to go first. I'm still smiling based on the intros, Kate, but um, thanks for thanks for teeing that up. Um, yeah, containment is a is an absolute um, sort of key step, right? And a lot of what we're going to talk about today about the negotiation phase, et cetera, is about buying time for containment, right? And in its simplest terms, uh, make sure we're safe, stop the bleeding. So I think with, as with anything in cyber, it's People process these technologies um, on the people side, having great, great vendors in um, uh, on the on the technical front, um, forensics and otherwise to to assist is really, really important. And on the process side, aside, again, there's a lot of things to think about, but at its core, um, isolating systems, um, disconnecting and otherwise um, ensuring that uh, you've either stemmed uh, the proliferation of the ransomware um, or otherwise able to contain it. And then on the technology side, you know, all the all the goodies that we know about, um, you know, whether it's endpoint detection and response, EDR tooling um, and other technologies in place. And so I think it, it is it is the, the traditional people processes technology model. But as you said, Kate, you got to do it quickly um, and pretty effectively, given the short time frame. 
uh, uh, within which you have to work before something um, becomes public, either because of the operational disruption, so it's obvious, um, or I think we're going to talk about a little later, Kate, some of the regulatory pressures, including from the SEC, uh, in terms of the issue just becoming a disclosure uh, event uh, for you. So I think that's that's the, the nutshell, right, when we think about containment uh, in, the, in those crucial first hours. And David, any thoughts on that? I mean, how do you how do you know when the coast is clear? It's a great question. You know, I'll say before I answer it is here's a situation where everyone thought it was clear, but it surely was not. Pretty recently, shortly after the holidays, stepped into an incident where the burn down list of conditions for containment were provided by a, a very good forensics firm and somebody internally had said, yeah, we're good. But no one actually checked to make sure that all the steps were taken. And so the threat actor was paying attention and, in fact, uh, you know, really then did the big exfil move. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it was uh, all the measures that were taken, but sort of the failure to double check the containment conditions had been made. So I think one of the things that is a good uh, thing to add to the checklist is making sure that the forensics firm is willing to put in writing, not that we would want them to write a report unnecessarily, but that, you know, would they be willing to put in writing if needed that that containment has been confirmed and as of what date? Uh, and that's something that I found has been really important to make sure that um, when we talk about containment loosely, ultimately we know that it's something that we can bookend, we can point to a date and time, uh, and we can be clear about what conditions that included. And this is important when the scope of an investigation is not the whole company, it's just a particular environment. So I think that's, that's the one pointer I would share. Uh, and, and the last is, you know, often boards, when we talk about this, boards want to know what's important. And I think it's important for them to ask the question, you know, if they're not bringing us in in the first moments, you know, what confidence level do we have that this has been contained and what were the conditions that led us there? Uh, and as we all know, sometimes clients organizations, they don't have the tooling or the confidence because of segmentation to get there. So it's how can we get to a place where we're comfortable if it's not perfect? Which seems like one of the areas that, you know, where, where outside counsel can really provide a lot of value, right? In addition to just putting things under privilege, you know, these are the different work streams. Tell us a little bit more about the work streams that you're seeing where, where counsel is really providing a lot of value in this context. Tony, David, you want to, who wants to jump on that one? I'll, I'll just start because um, I'm, not, I'm not on mute yet. But of course, you know, it's, as, as Tony said, you know, it's all about the, the people and having expert vendors. So you want to have that team sport, uh, you know, the, from forensics to threat intelligence, counter extortion, you know, if you need someone who can do payment, you know, data mining, crisis communications at the very core of it all. Um, but I think what's what, uh, and I'll, I'll turn it to Tony, because I'm sure he has strong views on this, is it's great when you have a wonderful band, right? But you need someone who's going to be the conductor, somebody who's going to be the incident commander or the leader. And we love it when clients are ready to do that. Uh, but often there's all these folks assembled who haven't practiced together. They really don't have the same, same sheet of music. And so I think it's really important that when you have all that together, that somebody's ready to sort of integrate it so that the client has kind of consolidated guidance. I agree 100 percent and and i was saying i, I want scott to actually uh, tell everybody how important outside counsel are to to the equation um so we'll kick it over to scott here in a second but um can agree with david Moore. you know part of i think um uh, the benefit and i think really the, the the ir attorneys like david and the practitioners like scott what they're so so good at um is the following right understanding the client's core objectives on the one hand, our operational resiliency, on the other hand, our brand and reputational protection, right? At the end of the day, that's the most important, I think, asset um, and priority for, for clients. Um, and so counsel can help, as, as David said, bring to bear the resources, again, from a people process technology uh, standpoint, because we tend to have had more at-bats than many of the companies um, that are experiencing maybe for the first time or second time or had, had a prior experience. So I think that's really the role. And we can talk about privilege in a second. I have some views on that. Um, but again, you know, uh, protecting brand, operational resiliency, all the technical mumbo jumbo and things like that will, ha will, 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 will happen and will work I'm very hard with uh, very, very uh, qualified experts to do that stuff. But to kick it over to the Scott, you know, th that sort of piece around uh, brand and reputational protection, I think, is is, is paramount, especially with ransomware. Because, again, Kate, it becomes public uh, really quickly. Right. Um, and you can't 99% uh, 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 of the time keep it a secret. 
That's right. Scott, can you guide us through a little bit some of these we reference the outside experts and the importance of communications, but can you guide us through some of what, what those strategic key principles are that are going to guide your work for the client in those earliest hours? Yeah, first of all, I will echo what Tony said. And I'm not just saying that for the benefit of my fellow panelists, in 80, 90% of the incidents that we're involved in, outside counsel either immediately or, or very quickly rise to the top and then end up leading it. They become sort of the George Washington, you know, on the Delaware in very chaotic situations, especially as David alluded to, where the team, the client, the company, the victimized company has not practiced, doesn't have its act together. Sometimes a CISO can play that leadership role, sometimes a general counsel, but more often than not, general counsel comes from a securities law background or a corporate background, not prepared. So GCs are generally best positioned and perform the best um, at the top of these pyramids in the, in, the, in the burning building of an incident. In terms of key strategic principles that guide communications response in the earliest hours, number one principle for communications, reputation, credibility, you know, goodwill, all that goodwill that you've earned over years are all at risk, not to mention share price or, or if you're a private company, valuation. So principle is act accordingly. We're in an environment right now where companies are in this double squeeze when it comes to communicating in ransomware incidents. On the one hand, you've got, as Tony alluded to, these tightening federal and state disclosure rules that are forcing public announcements of, of some of these incidents earlier and earlier, most significant, the new SEC rules that I know we're gonna get to, but also about half the states have attorneys general who require breach reports from victimized companies. And then they turn around and instantaneously put those reports on public websites. That's often how the fact of these incidents or the scale of these incidents gets out in the public. On the other end of the squeeze, you've got these increasingly brazen and sophisticated cyber criminals who are ready and willing and, and have the incentive to go public about their exploits if they think it's gonna give them tactical advantage to, to leverage a ransom payment. In other words, the hackers do their own PR. Even this week in a, in a significant incident, we've seen threat actors engaging with reporters. So when we come in and work with clients to build the communication strategy in the, in the storm of an incident, we're working very closely with the legal teams, including outside counsel, the technical teams trying to determine the facts, identify whom the company must communicate with and how, when that time comes, figuring out what those trigger points are for communications, including whether we have a looming regulatory disclosure that's gonna force disclosure, blocking out a narrative and communication tactics to best position the company to preserve, again, that credibility and, and goodwill and reputation with, with key constituencies. And let's let's stay on this topic of communications. And I think particularly with your comment about threat actors doing their own PR campaigns and talking with reporters, um, how are you handling that? Because oftentimes, how do you know if they're credible? And sometimes they're not telling the truth, right? So how do you, how are you threading that needle? Yeah, they tell all sorts of lies. Uh, one thing I think we may get to here is the presence in these incidents of, of the specialist firms that do nothing but negotiate with these guys. But then you've got the, the threat actors also sounding off. They've got their own bullhorn. They're, they're leaking documents supposedly stolen or actually um, stolen documents to, to journalists. So uh, it can really put the company on the back foot and it should all be part of a a very comprehensive um, planning process because most of this is foreseeable. Yeah, we're getting a lot of questions that are focused really on payment and payment considerations. So I think if it's okay, we can kind of skip ahead, skip ahead a little bit here um, and talk a little bit more about the risks associated with paying a ransom because those are also shifting here as well, right? Both in terms of we have the NYDFS that now requires heightened and accelerated disclosures regarding ransomware payments. Um, in addition to increased scrutiny from cyber insurers, there's just a lot more focus on the, you know, the fact of a ransom payment in addition to law enforcement considerations. Tony, could you walk us through here? What, what do you see as the, as the key risks right now associated with that process? It, it's, it, you know, you hate to say this as a lawyer, um, but, um, you know, it, it, it's very sort of an, an expected and sort of classic line that uh, really depends on the circumstances. I think there's risks associated with making uh, a ransom payment, um, as you noted, around regulatory disclosure um, obligations specific to making ransomware payments, right? Um, we've seen a couple of those uh, at the state uh, NYDFS, federal, you know, CERCIA sort of level. 
Um, but I think there's also risks associated with not paying in certain circumstances, right? Um, both res with respect to uh, um, litigation risk um, and, and otherwise. So uh, it, it's it's sort of both, right? Um, and um, one of the things that we always talk about with um, our clients um, that'll be you know very sort of second nature to David and Scott is um, how what's the process that we get to in terms of pay or no pay, right? And what are we paying for and what do we value that at, right? Whether it's um, operational resiliency, you have to pay for a decryption key because at the end of the day, as we've all been saying, uh, operational resiliency and your brand and reputation to be able to serve your customers, whoever they are, B2B or B2C, um, it is paramount. Um, or do you uh, have operational resiliency in the bag? That's not an issue. And you're considering whether or not you want to pay for uh, what we call data exfil, right? Data deletion, or at least a promise to do so. So we've seen in regulatory investigations, in litigation, um, and indeed even in sort of media uh, and, and, and PR and IR, investor relations in this context, um, risks associated with paying, but also uh, risks associated with not paying. Um, and that's not even sort of mentioning the kind of OFAC sanctions risk, of course, that you face if if there's a sanctions nexus associated with the with the payment. So I think it's really dynamic, Kate, uh, which is why um, I like the question. And and uh, you know, again, having having counsel and a team that has had a lot of at bats and that can think about this sort of uh, three dimensional chess aspect of uh, of making or not making a payment, um, it is critical. David, what are what are your thoughts? And particularly, are you seeing you know changes in terms of law the approach you know that law enforcement is taking, or those interactions with law enforcement as well? Definitely. I mean, I think I'll give you two examples of some you know frustrating trends. Um, you know, the first is that you know because there's been this greater focus on disruption by law enforcement and some tech companies, which I think I, you know, I strongly encourage. We got to get after the bad guys. Um, the bad guys are just not labeling their attacks they're not attributing them to certain groups and as a result when you want to go talk to somebody in the fbi they're not sure who's got this particular threat actor group so you have a lot of interest by folks who are curious if this is part of their case that means that there's not just one potentially concerning netflix series that you don't want to be a part of about the law enforcement story that no one wants to know the end of but there could be many so that can make that more complicated. And then the other piece of it that I think is challenging is if you don't know uh, who the threat actor is, if it's you know basically an unattributed group, it, it's a much more challenging conversation with other key stakeholders that matter. So when you're in front of a board saying, look, we have a ransom demand for $50 million and you know the following has occurred, they may say, well, what's our insurance coverage? You say, I have insurance for that, but the carrier won't confirm without knowing who the threat actor is, because that's key to their understanding of whether there's a sanctions risk, some other key uh, indicators. So that's another piece of it. And then the, th the, the other concerning trend is, and again, uh, it's much worse when uh, your systems are locked up and you can't operate. Um, but we are seeing a growing number of cases where data is exfiltrated, uh, and it's very damaging, very concerning. The communications piece is, is critical. And in carriers, insurance carriers, and a lot of other stakeholders are much less inclined to understand, be sympathetic, and grant, uh, you know, uh, you know, give you a budget for ransom payment if you don't have a lockup situation. When and it's so, just for data suppression. Just right. for data suppression. Um, and and so I think that that that's a more complicated dimension of this. It requires a lot of, of jousting with regulators down the line, and again, even more complicated when you're dealing with the litigation story. And how are you seeing both of you, the threat, you know, for threat actor intermediaries, right? We have the communications firms that will go and they will negotiate, you know, their, their sole job really is to negotiate and, and to interact with the threat actor, whatever your, your goals are, whether it's to buy yourself some time, if it's to keep the option of payment open, or if it's if you know that you want to make a payment. I think the other thing we're seeing is that because of the disruption and the newness of some of these groups, they also don't know who they're dealing with. Are you finding yeah, that as well? Because you want to you want to ask the experts, and sometimes the experts aren't even sure. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, maybe I'll start off and then kick it over to Scott here, Kate. But um, you know, we talked about at the very outset. You know, who who are the advisors that you bring on, and 
And uh, you're absolutely right. There are threat actor groups either because it's a ransomware as a service um, scenario where there's affiliates that are, um, like you said, I, I think I really like the phrase you use. They have less brand loyalty um, or just a, a, a new variant um, and a new threat actor group, as we've seen um, in the news um, uh, that that uh, that that hail from different parts of, of, of the globe. Um, but still, I think, um, right, the threat negotiator firms, um, they bring a discipline to this and you can really help your company, both management and the board, really make decisions based on data, right? So regardless of whether, um, you know, this particular threat actor has been seen four times or 15 times, more data um, is better than less data and it allows for informed decision making. So as an example, right, we recently had uh, a ransomware um, a threat actor that was relatively unknown um, and uh, was very new to the scene, but still through you know different connections with threat negotiation firm, we were able to cobble together, look, we've seen this particular threat actor, we think about five or six times. And then the statistics around, look, how often do they actually have um, uh, data uh, exfiltrated when they threaten it? What's the recovery rate if you get a decryption key? Um, it, what's the re-extortion re rate? Looks like zero for now. Uh, what are some of the MITRE uh, attack uh, methodologies used for your containment? And so I think that sort of data-driven analysis really helps companies in a panic think clearly about what's the value of negotiating, thinking about payment or not, um, and, and bringing sort of a rigor, right, uh, to the boardroom as well uh, when you explain sort of management's decisions and what that decision decisioning is based on. Yeah. And Scott, I, mean, we've, we, I think we've teed this up very nicely for uh, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't in terms of what a, what a difficult judgment call this is and how different it is, you know, based on the incident and for the client. So how do you how do you craft a communication strategy if, if you know that people you know that people are going to be dissatisfied either way? Right. Yeah. What do you say? What do you not say? It does. It can cut both ways. Significant reputational risks associated with paying and with not paying if those judgments become public. And we should recognize, you know, sometimes these payments, the fact that these payments do become public, as we've seen with recent events, that could be in rare instances, a company acknowledging payment. We saw that with CNA, JBS, uh, Colonial Pipeline, UC San Francisco. Sometimes they publicly admit it. Or as we've seen recently, an intrepid reporter figuring out the payment by digging into the Bitcoin blockchain or the threat actor outs the company. Now, more often, they'll out the company for not paying. They're, they're complaining and whining publicly that the company won't pay up. But sometimes they'll out the fact of the payment. So the company has to be ready to, for that to come out, that payment fact to come out, like it or not, and may or may not be in their control. But to your question about this cutting either way, if the company did pay, it raises questions about why it would, it would contribute to a cycle of criminality, because only God knows where that money went if the company paid. If they refuse to pay, and that becomes public, then the company can face challenges about why it didn't pay. You know, the question becomes, you had an opportunity to protect the data of millions of people, recognizing that the threat actors might or might not act honorably after receiving that payment, but you could get challenges. Hey, you know, now tens of millions of records are out and you had a chance to pay. And by the way, you had insurance behind you and you didn't pay. So it is a real minefield, no matter what decision you make. And it, it feels like there is an increasing expectation of accelerated communications, that if you say we've had, you know, we've had a network outage or a system disruption that kind of buys you, you know, maybe, a, you know, 24, 48 hours to figure out what's going on. But even companies that don't have a ransomware incident and really do actually just are unlucky enough to have a system, like a system outage or network disruption, people are like, oh, it's ransomware. And then they have to come out and say, no, it really wasn't. So, you know, it's, it is one, is that more than just like what I'm feeling is, is the, you know, is that a trend that you're seeing that there is this new, new expectation for more communication sooner? And if so, how, like, should you, should you say, should you acknowledge the ransom demand, you know, paying for it? How do you, how do you actually decide what to say? Because we know everyone wants to know as much as possible. Yeah, I think the, the tempo of communications has been supercharged by the two factors. Well, I'll, I'll even call it three factors. One, rising a rising tide of regulatory requirements. Two, threat actors with you know who put out uh, press releases. And three is just, as you said at the top, the increasing sheer volume of ransomware. You know, you mentioned uh, words like outages and service interruptions. I think one reality in the marketplace right now is a lot of audiences have been 
conditioned to assume that when they hear about an outage or a service interruption or a technical issue or even a cyber incident, these are euphemisms for ransomware attack. And employees and investors and others go right to, oh, you've been you've been the victim of an extortion attack. So companies need to factor that assumption into communications. Audiences are more cynical than ever. I think there's, uh, you know, platitude fatigue out there. But to your bigger question, yes, moving faster than ever and putting more pressure on communications, legal and technical teams to respond or curl up, say nothing until you have to 8K it and weather that storm for a couple of days of questions, which is probably the most uncomfortable place to be of all. Well, let's let's dive into the 8K because I do think we've talked about it. I think this is a good time to shift into reporting um, and we can start we can start with the SEC there because I think folks are, are <laughs> based on the comments that's what folks want us to talk about next um, and I'm wondering so the SEC has implemented you know new regulations that require public companies to file an 8k or a 6k it's within four days of determination that a material um, cybersecurity incident has occurred um, and I've you know the standard for what needs to be included I think is still evolving in terms of the market's understanding of that. Um, but I'm, I'm curious to know, you know, how have these regulations impacted the practicalities of how we're responding to ransomware? Um, how are you seeing companies assess materiality? David, you want to kick us off on that one? Sure. Look, this is nothing new. Of course, you have to disclose material facts. And for years, we've been advising clients when something catastrophic seems to be happening, what they should do. I think that two things have happened which are exciting. Uh, I mean, and I mean this in, a, in an optimistic in, uh, way, uh, and it's not just for companies that are subject to the SEC rules that we're talking about, it's for all companies. Because one of the greatest challenges in cybersecurity for all of the stakeholders we deal with is that we do not have a lot of information. There's not a, a lot of data available to evaluate how companies are managing this. And so um, at the same time as the SEC and a lot of government agencies are pushing hard for more information. This is at least one where the, the playing field is being leveled a little bit. So, um, you know, before companies evaluating whether to disclose would look at some of the traditional metrics. There's a three to three to four percent of annual revenue. Some of the normal disclosure triggers companies would look at. Now, the SEC has said more clearly that they want you to look at some fuzzy factors, and no one's really sure exactly what is intended. Other than, you know, look, if this means I can't go to my kid's birthday party, that probably is material. I'm going to disclose it to the markets. I'm not going to get in trouble for doing that. That's obviously not what the SEC said. But I think the point is it's not really that clear. And I think what we're seeing is a growing trend towards disclosure, even if you don't know it's material, because there's a four day. So that means that, you know, you know of, a, of something that seems like a big enough deal. And four days after that, you have to say something that something's not just going to be to the SEC, but it's going to be public. Uh, and you have the ability to update. And so we do see some prominent examples where uh, these updates have occurred. You know, Microsoft came out and said some things about an incident and they had to update it. Um, you know, United Healthcare has, has made more than one update. I think there's a link to something that is updated all the time. Um, so there's a, this trend towards disclosure. I think that for clients, and I'm, I know that I'm sure that, uh, you know, colleagues here have, have comments on this. For clients, I think it's important to study this. You know, and, and, you know, we are we have our own little machine learning tool that is sort of trying to make sense of this and predict where it's going. And at the end of the day, clients need to be thinking about, you know, how they describe not only what they're dealing with from a materiality perspective, but how they describe their cyber risk management process, which the SEC also calls for. And those disclosures used to be like this, and now they don't fit on the Zoom bubble that I have here. And and so we, we should pay attention to that and track it by industry. And for clients overseas, you know, that are subject to even more aggressive disclosure rules. You know, I was in Brussels for a couple of years and got my GDPR license to kill. I can tell you there, they're, ex they're expecting so much more from companies and they don't have these rules. So I think that these are in conversation with each other. And so I'm trying to be optimistic about it. Um, you know, and that's until the shareholder derivative suits come, of course. <laughs> if I could kind of tag along there, you yeah. know, um, we, uh, um, David, David and I each have, among other children, we each have a 13 year old um, uh, boy uh, and, and they go to the same um, school. And it's really interesting this year for math, um, the, the sort of head of the math department said, um, look, your, 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 uh, your boys, uh, you know, the, the students um, at the school, um, you know, uh, getting the answer right is important. So by analogy, right, um, getting the uh, getting the decision on the form AK or 6K, for example, um, is important. Um, but um, your your kids won't score well at all, right? And are in danger of getting a really bad grade if they don't show their work, 
right? So that's everybody remembers this from math, right? Part of it, more than partial credit, is showing your work, right? We can debate this sort of end result answer, but you, you know, many, many teachers will give you a zero if you don't show the work. And that's another sort of exciting part. I'll use David's word, uh, uh, exciting part of the new rules, right? The SEC in its enforcement actions around cyber, both prior to the rule and still now, uh, including in litigation, right, that we're involved in, um, uh, has this notion of disclosure controls and procedures. So um, uh, the consideration of quantitative uh, materiality factors and qualitative materiality factors, um, many, many of our public clients and non-public clients are documenting the protocol and process by which incidents like ransomware especially are escalated and escalated very quickly for discussion and consideration of materiality across these um, uh, quantitative and qualitative factors by disclosure decision makers internally documented appropriately while respecting privilege um, so that you can show the goods because look we have many many more ransomware incidents than form 8ks or 6ks in the same period, right, by an order of magnitude. And so it'll be really critical because we know the SEC's enforcement teams um, are calling um, uh, 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 companies um, in the wake of um, incidents, whether they're disclosed or not, um, is to is to show the goods on on the work, to show your work and, the, and to have that in place. And so it's a really good discipline that we're seeing, um, Kate, and something that uh, we think is really good for governance purposes um, and for the fulfillment of fiduciary obligations as a director or officer, you know, looking forward to things like share, shareholder derivative suits. So um, that's another feature, I think, of this that's really, really important. And it helps with a lot of the decision making, including when and how do we communicate about an issue, whether or not we uh, file an 8K or 6K. And let's stay on this for a moment, because I think what you're saying is so important. And we know the regulators will not, you know, if it's not documented, it's like it didn't exist for them in the context of an examination or an enforcement action. So who else should be involved? Who are the stakeholders? Who should be involved in this process as that information is flowing up from the incident response team, legal, right? But who else, you know, who else needs to know? Because the, the appetite for, you know, we've seen it also in DFS orders, right? Which I assume the SEC also will take, right? Which is the whole like, well, I didn't know. The information never got to me. They have no appetite for that anymore. Well, maybe I'll just touch quickly and then, and then pass one of my co-panelists. But um, a lot of the stakeholders that we've already talked about, right, in terms of in, certainly internal management and um, the disclosure committee or a subcommittee, um, the, the disclosure decision makers, quote unquote, that we see reference in uh, in SEC orders um, uh, and investigations um, and the like. But there's other players that we've talked about as well, like cyber insurers um, and a, a very prominent, I think, new player on the scene here um, uh, uh, is your outside auditor. Right. Um, when there's ransomware or really any type of you know major um, incident, especially if you're close to a 10Q or a 10K filing deadline, um, the out auditors have become really, really and, and probably rightly so, really, really aggressive around um, forensics and negative assurances that look, this ransomware or malware, um, the threat actor did not um, touch, manipulate, corrupt uh, in SOC, in scope SOC systems that are important to financial reporting or systems that connect to financial reporting. And so that's another just stakeholder, right, uh, uh, where companies have to think very uh, carefully about bringing them in the loop pretty early and making sure that they're satisfied, right? Um, because um, obviously for public companies, it's a big deal, for example, if a Q or a K um, is delayed, right, or if you get uh, uh, any kind of qualified opinion around that. Yes. Hey, and I they're like independent, to, uh, right? So it's not privileged by definition. You've, you've, you've got to give them the information that you need, but there's risk there. Yeah, go ahead, David. Sorry. No, I mean, look, I mean, oh, uh, uh, my quick take and then over to Scott is, you know, of course, we're all helping our clients bake that sort of new disclosure process. That's the sort of tabletop topic du jour, right? To have your SEC disclosure process tested because now you need to have somebody journaling the role of each of the key stakeholders so that you can show, as, as Tony said, that you did your homework. Um, and when you do share information uh, with outside players like an auditor, you know, we found that you can get away with you know, having some useful conversations on screen, talking about what you do. But you know, the one thing that would save everyone a lot of trouble and some legal fees is if companies would invest, and this is gonna be one of the aha moments from these tabletops is, you should have some file integrity management software. Frankly, for all of you, those of you out there that are using AI, I'm sure very responsibly, you need to be able to monitor the integrity of your data anyway. So if you can show your auditors that you have some basic integrity tools, 
that'll make that conversation a lot more straightforward and you'll have obviously have to do a little bit less in terms of uh, waiving privilege. The one other thing I'll say is that, you know, I think the, the SEC rules did not explicitly include as proposed this requirement that cyber expertise had to be on the board or in the process, which, you know, um, isn't really leaving the these board boards or companies off the hook in their determination. So it's important that that when they're sharing information and that's being explained, that someone actually makes sense of it. There's some evidence that they're engaging on it because it's not enough just to be handed, you know, kind of a big mess and being told now it's time to disclose. There needs to be an awareness of what's going on and a reaction that seems reasonably related. So from an enforcement perspective, we've seen that to be a problem. And you don't have to ask us. You can ask, you know, Tim Brown, uh, uh, SolarWinds, uh, you know, and uh, and other other uh, security leaders, what it feels like when they're raked over the coals. So fundamentally, this judgment about whether an incident is material is a legal judgment, as it should be. But to pick up on Tony's point about other stakeholders kind of drifting into the scope, I would argue, self-servingly, but I think importantly, this is based on our experience, that communication should have a seat at that table when assessing materiality. And the reason is that, you know, the new SEC rules expressly encourage companies to factor in their words, reputational damage or potential reputational damage into the materiality analysis. So I think that's an argument for giving communications, you know, a voice when making that materiality decision. That's a controversial position. And I'd say it's only 10 or 20 percent of, of incidents that were actually brought in at that stage. And that predates the new SEC rules from December. But communications professionals are often the best position to advise on reputational damage as the SEC is guiding companies to do. And are you seeing changes in terms of perception of reputational damage associated with ransomware? Has that shifted or is it, what are you seeing? Well, we got a couple of metrics, both of them a little bit crude and they're not specific to ransom incidents. It's more, it's more specific to cyber incidents generally post December 18th, post new SEC rules. We've been tracking all the 8Ks with, with an eye to public reactions. A couple findings. Number one, stock price usually takes a minor hit in the day or two after the 8K, but it generally bounces back a week or so later. Number two, social media chatter, obviously another indicator of, of public response. We see the volume of discussion of the attack company blow up between 5X, 10X, particularly if it's a consumer facing or a big household name. David mentioned Microsoft earlier, their 8Ks, and, and that's an example of chatter that blew up. Neither of these are factors that should be directly, you know, uh, programmed into the materiality assessment, but they are two things that companies are extremely concerned about when they know they've got an 8K. And do you see payment or non-payment as, how does that factor into that? Uh, does it? Of all the um, 8Ks, Post December 18th, legal, you know, practicing lawyers here, correct me if I'm wrong, I can't think of a company that disclosed a payment after December 18th in an 8K. I think I, there's a couple examples before December 18th, but no significant impact on stock when they do. That's interesting. That's good to know. Can I? We've got a question in here also about third party communications, particularly given we see so many because these large sets of data get locked up or exfiltrated. Um, and it's oftentimes not just, you know, the data owner or the environment where it happened, their data, but it's all our customers, lots of B2B. Can you talk us through kind of what are some best practices for considering when, you know, the timing and the content for those communications, if you have to communicate out early or should you communicate out early? Well, again, practicing lawyers here, I know we'll have a, a, a sharp opinion on this, but in some of these cases, if you are the cause, the source, if your company is the source of a third party data incident, you may have contractual obligations to your partners that may make it compulsory to notify them. I'll leave that um, to you guys. If you are downstream of the incident, in other words, another third party caused a breach, which has breached your data, then the communicate a, a key communications issue at the core of any of the, these incidents is, do I blame the third party who caused it and publicly blame them and generally We'd say yes. Those are a couple of initial considerations. I'll, I'll jump in here, Kate. You know, um, it, it dovetails it dovetails with the early sort of discussion we had around privilege issues. So, what I was going to say there is, you know, to the extent, for example, 
um, you're a B2B company, right? Um, the lifeblood of your company, the, 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 the value of your company is tied up in, in your customers, right? And sometimes you may have a concentrated group of customers. Um, if you're a B2B player who has had a pretty significant ransomware, um, attack, um, putting aside contractual notification obligations, um, to, as we say, uh, keep, uh, business sort of resiliency, um, intact to manage your reputation and brand, um, you have to be quite transparent, I think. And that's often our, our, our guidance. Um, and to think less about, um, you know, is everything that we're learning under privilege is, is privilege a shield here, et cetera. Of course, we're going to do what, uh, what, what, it, what it takes to, to manage, you know, internal communication, decision making, prioritization, things like that under privilege, because we want to protect that. But in terms of the sort of fundamental facts around what's happened and what the impact may be, um, I think uh, a dose of uh, transparency there, less reliance. Uh, on privilege issues um, is just what is better for the company reputationally and long-term wise. And so, um, again, um, where a team of outside counsel forensics communications has had that experience dealing with B2B a lot and can sort of navigate that, I think is is, is, a, is a real benefit for, uh, for clients, but um, early and often communication, unfortunately, um, and uh, being careful with what you communicate, but you have to be pretty transparent um, because those customers, while they'll understand that there's uh, there's that there's sort of facts you know early days, and that it's going to develop over time, um, the trust and relationship factor I think is is absolutely critical. And and again, the best incident responders, like folks like David and Scott, know that right, and can kind of echo the CEO and and how the board thinks about uh, those business relationships. That's right on. Well, and I see Bruce is now at the bottom, which means we have three minutes left, which means it's time for us to wrap up. So I did, I wanted to be sure that everyone got to share kind of concluding thoughts and any final final thoughts or insights that they have. Um, Scott, do you want to lead us off? Yeah, sure. Just briefly, I, the age of sweeping ransomware attacks under the rug is just over. Between the new regulatory regimes forcing disclosure and threat actors who are aggressive and loud, these incidents will go public. So companies should anticipate plan now with plans and involve communications at every step, earliest stages. Don't consider communication, the stepchild or, or an afterthought to be brought in right before you're going to 8K. That's great. David, you're off mute. I'll let you go next. Thanks. You know, I would say that uh, for those of you on who are on a board um, or on an executive team or know someone who is, I think this is a message for them because the the arc of, of liability and policy here is focused on holding executives accountable. When they're going after CISOs in the news, it's really they're going after the CEOs, but they just can't get a hold of them. So I think everyone should be mindful of that. Boards, if you're not comfortable or not sure about what's going on, it's a good idea to ask those questions or do your own review. Sometimes you need separate counsel. Um, we're seeing a whole lot more focus on that broader set of issues around, okay, was this handled right? Was there steps that we should have been taking? And was the board acting responsibly? And this is an issue not just in the states, but we're seeing it throughout Europe in particular. So I would I would uh, leave that uh, as a key piece of the puzzle. How about you, Tony? Um, you, you know, uh, we, we 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 typically and traditionally have the tabletops that are much more at the operational level uh, of responding to an incident, or um, uh, and then we sort of evolved into a legal communication sort of tabletop. And I think the other panelists and, and you've alluded to it um, these days. Um, it's all about sort of executive level and even board level simulations, and, and almost always they uh, they involve ransomware. And all of these tricky issues that we've talked about today can be brought to life over a couple of hours, um, pretty directly and directly relevant to the to the particular clients, um, industry, and and and, and customer base um, and regulatory reality and so um, cannot urge um, that enough and 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 cannot urge enough that when we do those types of tabletops and simulations to include all of the different stakeholders that we've talked about uh, whether you know specifically or uh, you know live or, or, or virtually or at least um, you know paying heed to the fact that they're you know in the room quote unquote so that's what I would leave the session with and thank you Kate for doing a great job <laughs>